become a Body Kindness Insider, visit bodykindnessbook.com and click on Get Started. Because real health is about being good to yourself, it's time for Body Kindness, the place where all bodies fit and weight is just a number. Hi, I'm Rebecca Scritchfield, author of the book Body Kindness, registered dietitian nutritionist, and host of this podcast. Today, I'm talking about the connections between dieting, body dissatisfaction, and eating disorders, and in particular, binge eating disorder. This topic is so important to me because eating disorders are serious mental health issues that don't get the attention they deserve. And many people don't understand that there's a relationship to dieting and poor body image. 91% of women diet because they're unhappy with their bodies. 81% of 10-year-olds are afraid of being fat. And 53% of teenage girls are either on a diet or they think they should be. And it's estimated that 8 million Americans have eating disorders. And that's really just the people who are getting care. My special guest to discuss this today is Carrie Anderson. Dr. Carrie Anderson has been treating eating disorders for 25 years with an emphasis on binge eating disorder. She currently is executive director for Green Mountain at Fox Run in Ludlow, Vermont, and acts as president of the Women's Center for Binge and Emotional Eating. Co-creator of the Am I Hungry? Mindful Eating for Binge Eating program, Carrie also co-authored the award-winning book, Eat What You Love, Love What You Eat for Binge Eating, a mindful eating program for healing your relationship with food and your body. Welcome to the show, Carrie. To get started, can you tell me a bit about yourself and your work? Well, I'm lucky enough, uh, Rebecca, to live in Vermont, and moving here was an act of self-care. I'm literally sitting in this office looking out. It looks like a snow globe. It's just the most peaceful and beautiful thing right now. We're getting lots of snow today, and so what brought me to Green Mountain at Fox Run in Vermont is my passion and desire to help women who struggle with binge and emotional eating. And we opened in 2015. In the fall, we opened a women's center that specifically addresses these issues. It's the only treatment center of its kind that only is for women and only for binge eating. And it's connected with that with Green Mountain at Fox Run, which is a women's retreat to address weight concerns concerns and food and has been here for over 40, almost 45 years. That's a really long time. I don't think many people know that I actually went to Green Mountain at Box Run. I grew some guts, I guess, and just emailed Marsha Hudnall and said, you know, I can do some social media. I really think I need your program. And I was a brand new dietitian. And she was just very open and said, yeah, you know, you can come and be a professional slash participant. And so I stayed for a week and I immersed myself. I did everything in the program. And I was you know, identified as someone who was a registered dietitian and an exercise expert that was also there to improve my own health and wellness and well-being. And I got to say, it was, you know, early in my career in nutrition, I was still very much in the diet mind. You know, I was just beginning to learn from Marsha about the ideas of size diversity and health at every size And really even mindful eating. I remember looking down when I was having my first meal there and seeing these cues to mindful eating that made so much sense. But, you know, as a chronic dieter and through all the training that I you get nutrition school, which is all about calories and specific nutrients and restriction, it was really a novel concept. But being there, even though it was just a week, I wish I could have stayed a month, you know, but it was so healing and so helpful to just push pause on my life, you know, and just be open to, to care. And it was an amazing experience. Later on, I got to tell one story later on, but I'm, I'm going to let you talk a little bit more. But in case I forget, don't let me forget about the banana. Just be like, what was that banana story you had? And we'll talk about it later. But I just, I love the work and what's being offered. I was so excited to hear about the binge eating disorder treatment center because I mean, let's be real. Like, let's tell people like, I mean, binge eating disorder was never defined as its own eating disorder until a year or two ago, right? Can you fill the listeners in on that? Right. It was considered eating disorder not otherwise specified 
And yet what happened was it was the most diagnosed eating disorder that there was. It just And so what we know is that binge eating disorder occurs more than anorexia or bulimia combined. And so what was happening is because it didn't have its own diagnosis, the research was glumped into. Uh, we wanted to know more about it. We wanted it to get insurance reimbursement. So there was a task group that came together and finally said, hey, guys, we need to, in the DSM-5, we need to change this. And so in 2013, in May of 2013, it became its own designated eating disorder. And so it's been getting a lot of, a lot more attention and people are understanding it a lot more. So it was really a wonderful thing that happened there for especially those people that are suffering from binge eating disorder. Do you ever get people who come to Green Mountain and figure out when they're there that they have binge eating disorder? I'm so glad that you said that. We've been doing some some statistics for some time. And we have a self-assessment that people fill out when they come in as new participants. And we have found that 50% of the women that come to us identify with struggling with binge eating. And those that participate in the treatment score about a 26 on the binge eating scale, which is moderate to severe, which would qualify them with a, for a, a diagnosis. So many people, and this is what's my passion here, is that most people that have binge eating disorder, we know that they're seeking weight loss. They're driven by this incredible feeling of shame that they have done this to themselves. I eat in this way and I would be so incredibly humiliated if anybody knew that I eat in this way because in this culture, you know, people are blamed for their size. And if you would just had self-control or if you would, if you could just, you know, stop eating and exercise more. And what happens though is the inherently of the disorder is that there's these incredible in secret binge episodes of eating food. So you think about that. Who's going to talk about it? Who's going to raise their hand at their doctor's office or, or say, oh, by the way, this is how I eat in secret and how much food I actually am eating. And so there's no incentive for somebody to come forward and raise their hand. So what happens is that they're driven by this desire to lose weight in order to be completely acceptable. And I'm going to talk about this internalized thin ideal that drives all eating disorders. And people may not believe that somebody that is binging, that is somebody that really has this desire to be thin, but that's exactly what's driving it. They feel and their self-worth is all based on their size and their appearance. Well, and that's a message right like we're not born with that you know that is a message that is conditioned in us through what we see what people say around us the media that whole thing we're presented with one image this is what it means to be acceptable and then we twist it and say oh and healthy too <laughs> right Right. Now we're getting the healthism and that if somebody if you are somebody of a large stature, then you must not be healthy. Yeah. And you must not care about what you put in your body. You must not care about exercise because of the way you look. So people are attracted to uh, the Green Mountain of Fox Run program because they may have this desire to lose weight. Now, interestingly, we are not a weight loss center. People may believe that or or hear that or whatnot, but it's we deal with women's weight, but we come from the inside out. We come from a place of helping them internalizing self-worth and self-care. And you experience that. So you know that that our focus is not on on weight loss, but they show up here. Oh, of course. I mean, but what's amazing about that is that you exist, right? That someone could say, hey, I still want to lose weight, but I like what you're saying. Maybe this is what's missing. You know, maybe this is what I need. And when you show up, I mean, it is just everywhere you turn, positivity and optimism and compassion and worthiness. I mean, it's just, it's the environment. That is what you're going to get there. And your inner critic could be a strong beast in your head, but every minute you're there, you are going to get compassion and love and caring. And it's really what's missing. And you do learn skills for how you can cope with wherever you're at. But 
I really love this idea that, like you're saying, 50% of the people show up with indications for binge eating. It's, it's almost like you have this continuum of care that if they need more, you can offer it through the treatment center because it's it's nearby, right? It's like integrated. Exactly. It's a it's an umbrella. It's like an arm. It's two miles away. We have a shuttle that, that goes back and forth from the retreat center where they stay down to the outpatient center where all the therapy takes place, both individual and group programs. So, and that's exactly why I'm here is to offer more than just, I mean, they've always had a cognitive behavioral psychosocial kind of a psychoeducational program, but we just wanted to go deeper into being able to offer psychotherapy and really address the why. Why Why do I do this to myself? Why do I eat in this way? And also, you know, continue to look at strategies to be able to, to help them stop the behavior. The goal always with binge eating treatment is to cease binge eating, you know, and I think that so the focus would be on that and then the body healing, the relationship with the body, relationship with the food. There is a what we call eating pathology and thought processes that go, that feed the disorder. And and of course, that needs to be addressed. So here we have this pool. The best place to find people that need binge eating disorder is people that are seeking weight loss, professional help professionals and whatnot. It's anywhere from 30 to 50 percent. I've heard a number of statistics of people that are showing up, bariatric surgeons, um, medical supervised weight loss treatments, weight watchers, whatnot. They all have many, 30 to 50 percent of them have a binge eating problem. And so they're not, like I said, they're not raising their hand and saying, hey, I need eating disorder treatment. So that's why I think that I really have a strong feelings about what we're doing here. Here because some people come here and say, yes, I have an eating disorder and I want to get treatment. But many, many, many people show up here with the thought that they need to lose weight and then realize that they have a, an eating problem and an eating disorder and they're able to get help. How do you, what are some ways that you help them start to work on accepting that the weight loss they desire may not be accessible if they're truly going to choose health. Right. In fact, I'm going on a speaking kind of a tour, if you will, conference tour this spring. I'm speaking at least four different places on, but I want to lose weight. How to move somebody with binge eating from a weight focus to a recovery and a health focus. And so that's exactly what that what we do here. And so the key with it is really to validate as to, of course, you want to lose weight. You live in this society and you've been living with this judgment from others and this cultural thin ideal. And so tell us more about what it's like, right? Because I think that if we jump too quickly to say, oh, no, we're not going to help you do that at all. We don't we're not a weight loss center. I mean, they understand that that's not our focus. But I think that what happens if I try to take that away, that's really scary. For us to come to them and say, okay, I just want to let you know we're going to treat this eating behavior, but you need to give up your dream of losing weight. So it's really a fine balance. But what we do is we validate what their experience is and we understand it. And yet then we start moving to them to the evidence base of the inside out change process. We move them to this focus of, of healing and a relationship with uh, healing with body, healing with mind, healing with relationship with food and show them that that long-term sustainable change around health behaviors come from an intrinsic or inside-out approach. So we get them more focused on the changing their relationship with food and their body and more on, on behavior change and really get them away from thinking about weight loss measures. We don't weigh our, our clients here at all. We stay away from concept of BMI. We stay away from anything that might measure from an external perspective of their progress. 
So we help teach them mindfulness to be able to pay attention to those feedback loops in their body because their body's so wise. If we can learn to re-engage with the body instead of rejecting it and kind of cutting ourselves off at the neck down, if we can re-establish a relationship, the body's got a lot of things to tell us about what we like to eat, what we don't like to eat, when we eat, when we don't need any more food, what movements do we like to do in our body, what gives me energy, what makes me have more clarity. So we try to empower these women that say, you've been told all your life that you can't trust yourself when it comes to your body and food. And so what we're trying to do is reverse that and say, you absolutely can trust yourself. Let's engage in this mindfulness journey, this experiment with yourself to return to home, return to the heart, yourself, your body, and it will lead you to be more autonomous and empowered in the decisions that you make around your body. Because research shows, Rebecca, that nobody wants to be told what to do when it comes to their body. It's interesting because, you know, we're, we're told that you can't trust yourself. You need to follow this guru and, and this is what you need to do here and you, this is how you exercise and this is how you're supposed to eat. But research, long-term research will show that we will rebel against that every time. At some point. <laughs> Nobody wants to be con- bossed around and controlled, you know. Like, I, I cannot stand that concept of, tough love. It's like, um, no such thing. You know, there is nothing loving about being tough and criticizing. And you and you've said so many good things. And I would concur that in in my experience in an outpatient setting that, you know, and I have had some clients who have tried to work with binge eating disorder in outpatient. I do find that having a treatment program helps them to get healthier more quickly and then they can step down. That's just been my personal experience. But even if what what we would say maybe not diagnosable is binge eating on the spectrum, but maybe more emotional overeating and, you know, there's similarities, right? The dieting in body image, le- you know, metabolically leads to cravings, you know, leads to disordered behaviors around food, which then fuels the you're not good enough and this is why you need to work even harder or something's wrong with you and that we need to just cut all that off and say that's not health and well-being and you know when we we want to help you address your weight concerns but it's not through trying to control it it's through trying to heal what's really broken and work with the mind and like you said mindfulness over and again That's exactly what we need. Well, we have to get focused on the now. In fact, our campaign for this year, for 2017, is called Be Her Now, hashtag Be Her Now. And there's a beautiful uh, free online course that you can register for through our website. And it's become so popular because it really resonates with people. It really brings up a sadness, I think, for people to think, you're right, I've been putting my life on hold, waiting for the wait or waiting for something to happen before I'm going to fully engage in my life, fully in, use the gifts that I have. And so there's a loss. You're looking back and you go, gosh, I, what have I been doing? I mean, six months are going to go by, a year going to go by, everything's going to go by and you're going to find yourself looking back and go, why didn't I just live now? And so this mindfulness concept is this idea that we're told that If our bodies are a certain size or not, doesn't look a certain way, that one, we shouldn't be doing certain activities. (laughs) Okay. So should be wearing swimsuits going swimming. We, you know, you're, you're, (laughs) don't even go to the beach, (laughs) damn it. (laughs) Right. Right. Don't have fun with your kids. Right. You know, How so, dare you? How dare you enjoy your current body? So, you know, don't buy, you know, just don't wear nice clothes because wait till you can get into a certain size or, you know, don't go online and look for a mate because, you know, nobody is going to marry you because uh, of the size you are, you know, and it, it, it brings up and, you know, I have a personal story behind that as well. But, you know, I, so it really is important to me that that now looking back here in my, you know, my mid age to say, just take it from me. Don't put your life on hold. Just get out there and do it. Because what we teach at Green Mountain is that the way that we eat, the way that we move our body, the activities that we choose to be in, you can, no matter what size you are, 
you can get benefit and have joy through this process. You know, think about what it feels like, the weightlessness when you're floating in the, I love water, but you know, to to be immerse yourself in in uh, the self care of, of uh, and the relaxation of being in water. You know, the thing is, there's modifications that can take place to keep people safe so they don't get hurt. We've got a, a wonderful exercise physiologist that does that here at Green Mountain. That people will come and say, I haven't moved for you know 15 years, and we get them up there doing things that they never believed they could do. You know, yoga poses to snowshoeing. You know, to to Vermonting. Type- Vermonting. Yeah, I love that. If someone says, what's Vermonting? And basically, it's getting out of doors in the beautiful scenery of Vermont, whether that be hiking, walking, and or snowshoeing. And that's Vermonting. But just do it. Go out. You know, what would you do if this was it? Do it. I love that. I love that so much. So let me, you had alluded to a little bit earlier about that you felt like really personally passionate about this and a, and a personal commitment to this? Was, was there something in your, in your career path or, you know, like anything that you wanted to share to help, you know, help kind of show listeners like why, why helping, you know, in recovery, whether it's from chronic dieting to eating disorders, why it matters so much to you? Well, this is a, a personal passion and then it became a professional passion. But personally, you know, in the seventies, I was, a uh, I grew up, through high school in the 70s. I was from the disco age and <laughs> I did have a boa. Studio 54. <laughs> and uh, starting in uh, my late grade school and into junior high, I uh, when I had my little, my growth spurt, before my growth spurt, I was a little chubby and I got uh, teased incessantly. I had an emotional eating issue before I started, before I had a, a body image issue, interestingly. I started using sugar as a around eight years old to help calm my anxiety disorder. I didn't know I was doing it. So I was creating these neural pathways where anytime that I got really stressed out, and I got stressed out a lot because I do have a, a problem with regulating my nervous system. And I think that many people that have binge eating problems or emotional overeating problems, they're really just trying to figure out how to regulate themselves. And I, I figured out how to do it. And it works. Don't let anybody tell you <laughs> that <laughs> that emotional eating and food does not work. It totally it- <laughs> works. It totally works. I, I wrote that in Body Kindness. I said, here's the thing. It works. Now, you only need 25 grams and we do way more, but it chemically works. <laughs> yeah. It, you know, and we always say, it. of course it works in, until it doesn't, until it becomes something that really starts to, to, to beat yourself up you know, emotionally and physically. So anyway, that was my background is that I had this emotional affinity, this neuro uh, pathway that anxiety takes sugar, no anxiety. I mean, it, it just that that's how it worked. So then when my body image started to take hold, I immediately and I was raised completely with the thin ideal. I was raised in a, a family and a culture that I would get the guy, I would get the job, I would be successful if I looked a certain way and I was a certain size. And I constantly got told that if I didn't lose weight, nobody would love me, no one would marry me. I mean, it was really that cut and dry. And so I I took that in. And so I started dieting. In junior high, I would go to this church basement and weigh in with Weight Watchers and had my sheet with all these other women. They kind of, I was their mascot and I was so good at it, Rebecca. I was such a, I was such (laughs) a good star performer. (laughs) My gosh, I'm telling you what, I would go in and I'd get on the scale and it would go down and I'd check off every box perfectly. And back then you had to eat liver every week and I would save up. I got three tablespoons of of ketchup and I would save it every week for my liver so I could tolerate it. So anyway, the bottom line is, is I became a really good dieter. And so what happened is every time that I would lose weight and then something drama, whether it be a family drama, a boyfriend drama or whatever it was, I didn't know how to handle it. I didn't know what to do. So I began binging. I never really, I mean, I used sugar to regulate, but I never binged. I mean, outright cases of 
you know, Twinkie, frozen Twinkies is one of my stories. I ate a whole case one afternoon in a dark basement with my back up against a freezer, a chest freezer, with a case of frozen Twinkies in my lap. And all 24 of them took me all afternoon. I just gnawed on them ate it over and over. That's binge eating. The problem is, is that in the 70s, nobody knew what that was. What's wrong with Carrie? I was so humiliated. Do you think I'd ever tell the Twinkie story to anybody until I knew that it actually was something? And so what happened is I subsequently, I did get treatment. They called it non-purging bulimia at the time I got treatment in the 80s. And then I went on to, of course, Hey, my undergraduate, I was a superstar. I was still obsessed with food and diets, even though I I quit binging. You know, that's an interesting thing is that I felt like I really couldn't fully heal until I gave up the idea that there was a way of eating that I could do and gave up dieting. Now, did treatment in the 80s, did they acknowledge that dieting was part of the problem, that you were, that it was too much dieting that was triggering the eating or, or no? No, absolutely not. It was an addiction model. So that, that was how I was treated early on with that. My undergraduate was in exercise physiology and nutrition. No surprise. <laughs> Yeah, we lo- all the, it, it, it's like, yes, this is great. Calorie counts. Grams, where's my <laughs> calculator? Gonna, I am going to get control of this. Yeah. You know? And so it wasn't until I went back and got my master's and became a therapist. And I have always, I've never treated anything except eating disorders. I've been very focused from the time that I, I went back and got my master's, the time I did my internships and whatnot. I've worked for eating disorder treatment centers. And so that, that's been my, my story. My second wave of passion came that is learning about mindful eating and learning that diets don't work. And that unless somebody lets go of the diet, and I know it's really scary and turns inward in a mindful way to take care of themselves, to regulate their energy, their emotions, to regulate our nervous systems. Can I going, what I did is I went back and I realized now that I've been studying things with the neuroscience is now confirming It's so, so confirming and validating that that's exactly what I was trying to do. I no longer look at those scenes in my mind of, you know, eating the box of Twinkies shamefully. Absolutely. I was just trying to figure it out. I was trying to, I was completely, you know, I get either get too overwhelmed, your nervous system, many of us, and now there's theory with understanding this in terms of traumas and lack of attachment and bonding and all kinds of things that, that cause our nerve. And, and it could be generational. You know, epigenetics will tell us that, that I, I could have this wonderful family, but somewhere in my history has frayed my nervous system. And what happens is that I can become dysregulated very easily, but it takes a long time for me to get back to baseline. And those are the individuals that need to know that, hey, you're just trying to take care of yourself. Let's teach you a new way to do this. And that's why you're turning to food. Yeah. Well, and I remember reading somewhere, and I want to say that it was scientifically, maybe you can confirm that this is true, that it's up to three, like trauma can have an impact up to three generations. So like for me, my mom's lived traumas and my grandma's lived traumas could be being passed in some way genetically and just behaviorally like how we were being raised that could have an impact. Absolutely. There, there's some really good work out there that talks about Holocaust survivors, that if you have a grandparent that survived, that your nervous system is compromised. We know that during 9-11, women that were pregnant at the time of 9-11, what happened is that the babies are compromised in terms of their nervous systems and their, their ability to handle stress. And so we know the early childhood abuse, whether it be neglect or whether it actually be a physical or a sexual abuse, we know that they have a harder time regulating their nervous systems. And so you just look around and say, no wonder anxiety disorders are the number one mental health issue that there is. And then what happens, you have secondary behaviors, whether it be substance use or eating disorders that are helping people to cope. So the message, I, my passion and the message, because it comes from a personal place as well, is that let's not hide, let's not be shameful 
about this, you're trying to figure out how to deal with life and deal with stress. And you might have a little bit more challenges than other people. And so let's empower you and give you the feeling of confidence and competence and autonomy and your ability to regulate your own body. And mindfulness is really the only way to do that, Rebecca, because you have to know what your body's doing to be able to counter it and check it. And let's talk more about mindfulness because through you mentioned in the very beginning about the whole idea that we're taught not to trust our bodies and mindfulness builds trust. Do you remember the first time you got just you remember hearing about mindfulness or learning about it and you know like any memory of that and then I also want to get into the books that you've written about it too. My first exposure was I was in 1999 um, when I was a therapist I got some real extensive and training with dialectical behavioral therapy. Marsha Linehan was the founder of that out of University of Washington. And I was lucky enough to be able to spend a week with her in a training, not one of the her trainers, but actually with her in learning about dialectical behavioral therapy. And it's basically what they call a third wave cognitive behavioral therapy. And now there's all kinds of those. There's the ACTs, MBSRs, and all these types of mindfulness-based treatments. And what they're saying is that it's not, they realize that cognitive restructuring or cognitive thought process in terms of the, the thoughts, the feelings, and the behaviors, there's something there. But if it's not embodied... Right. If it's not mind-body connection, it's not going to, because our minds are not always right. Believe it or not. <laughs> we make up stories all the time. All the time. <laughs> right. You can't trust your brain because it's, its job is to create, you know, all these great stories. <laughs> so what they found is that mindfulness will bring you back to the to the body in terms of, of what the sensation, you know, that emotions are expressed in the body as sensations. That's why they call them feelings. So, you know, it's not just all in your head. It's in your body, your energy states, your hunger and your fullness cues, my pain, my, and so now they're finding all these mindfulness-based programs that people can then understand what their body's telling them in these feedback loops so that they, you can correct it before you get to something. I think that the process that most women go through, and I work mostly with women, so you, so men out there, if you're listening to this, it's just not been my focus. You have all these issues as well. <laughs> There's nothing special about you. <laughs> So, but what happens is that if we can pay attention and check out throughout the day, we don't have to wait to the end of the day to get the floodlight reward or the the big load reward. You know how many women that have binge eating or emotional eating issues that they hang on all day long for their big reward? right? When they finally has time for themselves. And so, but what mindfulness, and so you've completely detached from your hunger, your stress, everything all day long. I just got to white knuckle it and get through. But what mindfulness tells us is to check in, in, you know, all throughout the day, in the morning, and just these mindful moments and whatnot, and say, oh, I'm anxious. Hmm, let me do some breathing for that. Oh, I'm hungry. It's not I'm starving or I'm completely stuffed. It's I'm starting to get a little hungry. Let me eat something so that I can stay clear and keep my energy up. Right. You know, it's this these little checks and balances all throughout the day. The cushion is one of my my mindfulness teachers here talks about is just really cushion yourself throughout the day. And we she also calls it the twinkle lights of pleasure. It's all throughout the day that we notice and we pay attention and we create for ourselves. It's a, a mindset of self-care so that we're not always looking for these big, you know, rewards that's going to numb us out and take us into la-la land. And uh, because we're we're not feeling like that we're so deprived by the end of the day. Yeah. Well, and that's very circular, though, because I think in order in order to agree to practice mindfulness, you have to be willing to want to take care of your body even if you feel like you can't trust it or you're at war with it or you hate it, you know, like because you're talking about building this compassion voice and this willingness to say, hey, 
What's happening right now that really matters? What do I need? And it's a complete shift from dieting, which says you're not good enough, your needs don't matter, right? Which actually creates anxiety, which feeds into the cravings, right? And then, and so it's like when you follow a mindfulness approach, it really starts with this idea of being able to accept yourself just as you are, even if you're not at complete peace right now, if you can buy into, like you said, be her now, right? And be present and aware and find that desire. I want to help you. I want to take care of you. I want to meet your needs. And what you're saying is, is when you can do that, and it doesn't have to take a lot of effort, but that practice prevents that sort of overwhelming flow of a need to just emotionally check out and replace it with food. Well, mindfulness is staying in the present moment without judgment. See, people always think of presence and in the present moment is the only piece of mindfulness. There's a second piece that's really critical in order for mindfulness to work, and that is to be without judgment. And so, we have something that we kind of for big beginners about in terms of body kindness and 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 really approaching the the body is something called body neutrality and what that means is that cuz sometimes it's a big leap for people to say you want me to to love my body these affirmations of love you've got to be kidding me i i can't <laughs> i can't stand myself so what we say is like okay i understand let's let's look at that a little bit how about if we just become neutral about it and not hate it how about if we have no judgment about it in the beginning and just be mindful of checking in in terms of our own body awareness and paying attention And then what happens is that as we start to help them more towards self-care is that why do we take care of ourselves to feel good? See, here's the thing is that we're being told to be good all the time. And it's not about being good. It's about feeling good. And that goes back to the neural pathways in terms of the reward system. If we can feel better in the moment and recognize that, oh, I feel good when I do this. I feel good when I eat that. I feel good when I move in this way. I sleep better. I'm more clear. What happens is it has this positive reinforcement for those behaviors in the now. And so they're more likely for us to repeat them. So I said, I always say, you don't have to do this because you love your body. You have to do this because you feel better in your body, right? When you do this. And then I say, okay, I've never known anybody to care for something that they don't care about. So let's then shift this to this body respect. And then we have what we call the voice of self-compassion. And so we use this voice of kindness and compassion to say, of course, you're feeling tired. Let me help you make uh, you feel less tired or let me take care of those needs. Of course, you're feeling anxious. Oh, well, let's see if we can take care of those needs. So you're ta- you start to do a self-care and take care of yourself. And ultimately, you realize, wow, if I take care of, wow, you blow your I mind. feel amazing when I'm nice to myself. I know. Exactly. So it's kind of like, you know, you don't start with, okay, love yourself, and then you'll take care of yourself. Take care of yourself, and then your love grows, and the kindness grows, because you go, I never realized that feeling good and taking care of myself was so powerful in terms of how it affects my life and how it affects how how I feel good and like myself, right? So it's not about how you look. And really, it is it is the way out of the diet culture. It's the way out of all that BS. And it's not going to be easy day one. You know, I think going to Green Mountain is a very smart choice as a starting point, but it's something that you commit to. But the more I believe Everything you're saying, the more you embrace mindfulness and self-compassion, you immerse yourself and you get the skills and you get these tiny experiences of what it feels like to finally be kind to yourself, that becomes the reward, right? And then you you want more of that. And then then later it gets easier to accept your body and even maybe be body confident and body loving. But it's like, it's like the end game, you know, and and even when you love life so much more and you've recovered from emotional eating or binge eating and, and, and it's, it's, you wouldn't trade that life, 
you know, with the life you had before. But we're still in diet culture. Something's going to come up, make you feel not so good for a minute. But now you're going to have the tools to say, you know, that doesn't serve me. That's not helpful. And you're going to be able to much more quickly push that aside and just kind of continue on your healthy path and continue taking care of yourself. Right. And that's what it's really about. That and that in a in a nutshell is how we can take somebody from being really focused on their weight to weight not being that big of an issue at all. And that's what we all deserve. I mean, you know, and we've got to figure out how to dismantle diet culture. But I also believe that it starts within because when our, our own and it's difficult in diet culture, I'm not trying to say, it, oh, come on, just do it. You know, but when we ourselves can be more compassionate and less judgmental, we do that for ourselves, we do that for others. And then we have families and communities that are becoming more compassionate and more accepting of, you know, diversity of shapes, sizes, you know, everything. And then I think that's a very big part of how we say, you know, this isn't right. Enough's enough. I I feel like it's been going on for decades. Like you mentioned the 70s. I was born in 76. So like even before I was born, it was going on. But my whole lifetime, it was going on. I mean, Naomi Wolf in the 90s tried to warn us and say, you know, our obsession with thinness is, you know, is is not good. And it just kind of comes back with something else. And, you know, now it's clean eating. And, you know, that's a whole other thing. But it's like just, I think, to know and accept, you know, we're, we're I think the public is hearing words like diet culture more and more often. And it's important to understand that this is part of what says is worthy and valuable is your appearance, but it's not necessarily healthy. And the stuff you did to diet may have actually been responsible for weight gain. You know, we're seeing that in studies too. And so that whole idea of rejecting dieting, but then, well, what am I going to do? Well, You're going to take care of yourself. You're going to do mindfulness. You're going to learn how to regulate your emotions and with self-compassion, like that is the thing. And it's just a matter of how you go about doing that. Tell me about the book you co-wrote with Michelle May, who gave Body Kindness and Advanced Praise. I love all her work. I'm excited to know that you were a big part of that. So tell me more about it. Well, when I was in my doctoral program, when I was 50, I had this life crisis, when you have midlife crisis. When I <laughs> Brene 50, Brown calls it a spiritual uh, yeah. awakening. <laughs> so I had already been practicing for 20 years and, and working in the eating disorder treatment industry. And I decided that the binge eating population of eating disorders, and this was before it became a diagnosis, I felt it was underserved and misunderstood. I think that I still think that we have some misunderstanding. There's an interchange in the healthcare world, even in the mental healthcare world, that obesity and binge eating disorder are, are used interchangeably. And that's scary to me. And so what happens is that maybe well-meaning, but people come to us and say, you know, that I want to lose weight. And then what happens is that you you put them on the very thing that led them to have the disorder. And then what happens is I feel that that women um, with binge eating disorder get lost or even in unintentionally but somewhat shamed and validated in a traditional eating disorder treatment setting. Okay. So, I mean, this is a personal opinion and I kind of go out on a limb with that. So, I felt... So I stepped out of that world for a little while and went back to college and got a doctorate in behavioral health. And the intention for me was to really find out what works with this segment of the pop- the eating disorder population with binge eating. And so that was my intention. So that was a long way to tell you that I was doing, I wanted to do a research project on women with binge eating disorder. And I ran into Michelle May because I loved her 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 mindful eating cycle that she is her structure for her program it looked just like a behavior chain analysis to me <laughs> <laughs> so i come from a thought process of okay where's the cue or the, the in the trigger and then what happens and then what's the result and then how does that and so i thought she's really i don't i don't want to recreate the wheel let me see if i can use her model in my research 
So I went to her and she agreed to do this research project and through my uh, for my dissertation. And so we did. We ended up taking 38 women with diagnosed binge eating disorder through a full 10-week treatment program and some aftercare in a course of a, a year. It was a huge undertaking because the program was 10 weeks plus aftercare and it was twice a week that we met with these. And it was completely unfunded. You know, we don't have NIH giving us money to do this. <laughs> and so what happened was there was such a wonderful results as a result of this. Uh, it was showed that mindfulness and mindful eating was a great intervention for binge eating and that, that these individuals ceased binge eating. And a one-year follow-up showed that only a very slight percentage of people that went through this program a year after continued not to binge. Those that did go back to binging, the common denominator was that they went back to dieting. It was completely fascinating. So what we decided to do is write a book about it. So that's how I got, um, and then we put together a, a program to help outpatient therapists have a a program to have treatment for people with binge eating disorder. So there's a training program with that. So we work together in Phoenix. We still, I'm still the, the you know, co-founder of that and, and co-author of the book that goes with the program. And we still, in fact, I have a, a conference call with her later today. We still do some projects together, even though I've moved out here to Vermont for the Green Mountain programs. Yeah, that's amazing. Michelle May, she was one of the first people I interviewed. When I first became a dietitian, like social media was really just coming around. And so I was, I was blogging already. My master's was in communications from Johns Hopkins. So I was kind of like doing the both a career change doing both at the same time. And I forget how I was blogging for a site called Diets in Review. It's probably still around, but it's all diety. I mean, it was like I said, in the beginner, I was a big time part of the problem. And I ended up getting a copy of her book and doing an interview. And it was at same thing like I was talking about with Marsha was like, wow, you know, mindful eating makes so much sense. <laughs> and it, it was just such an eye opener. And I mentioned earlier about going to Green Mountain. And I said I had a banana story. So I, I finally found a hook. So at Green Mountain, it's very, you know, there's the set meal times and you're eating mindfully without distractions and you can really tune in to your level of hunger and your fullness and your satisfaction. And, and for someone, you know, like me who struggles with eating too quickly and overeating, you know, and not even necessarily triggered by like kind of a big tangible emotion, but just, I mean, I could take it back to waitressing at Ponderosa. I could take it back to we had Wick. And so it was like when we got, we had food insecurity some weeks, you know? And so when we got it, it was like, eat a lot of it, you know, yay, like life is good. And so, so, and then of course all the chronic dieting and um anyway, I was still dealing with Eating at night, especially something sweet. And so I, I remember the first time my heart sank when I was there. It was when like I shut the door to my room and I was like, holy shit, like where's the refrigerator <laughs> for nighttime? <laughs> And, and it was scary, but also exciting, almost like this is a challenge, like to prove that I can actually live without this comfort eating or whatever I was saving up for that was going on. And, and I remember being told like, Hey, you know, we've, you know, we've got snacks. If you're hungry at night, it's no big deal. You know, it's a nominal, you know, like a, like nominal fee donation. It was like a dollar for banana and peanut butter, you know, and it, I bet it didn't even cover the cost. It was more about like a way of, you know, if you're hungry, here's where you can get food, you know, like later at night. And so it was like several days in and I had happened to also be, I had found out when I was there that I got a speaking engagement, a keynote. And of course I had nothing ready and it, it was all diety actually, it was, you know, so I was like early in my transition. But anyway, I had decided that I would take some some time in the evening to do this work and I was working from it in the room and it wasn't super late. And whether it was a true need, like burning through the mental energy of thinking through all this or the energy of the deadline or whatever, I decided that I'm going to go to the snack, you know, social area. And I you know, took my dollar out and take my computer and go up to like 
the bar area basically and said, hey, you know, I'd, I'd like a snack. I'd like a banana and peanut butter and got, you know, OK, great. Open up my computer, type and type and type in. They bring out the snack and I reach for it and I go in to take a bite and like keep typing. And the person just gently smiles at me and like pushes my laptop down to close it. <laughs> and I was like, what are you doing? And they said, hey, I totally respect you have work to do. I also want to respect your body. And then if you are hungry, you will probably get most out of eating if you can focus on eating and then go back to your work. And it was the kindest thing ever, but it was also like, oh my God. Like I eat at night when I'm working too much, when I'm trying to think and I'm dirtying up my computer because I'm doing two things at once. And, and just to have that demonstration of like, here's how you set a healthy boundary. It was so freeing. I'm so grateful for it because it was, you know, it was like how somebody else could think in a way that I wasn't yet ready to think about. But it gave me the experience and then the training to to practice that. And I'm so grateful for it. But I thought you would get a laugh out of it because that is that's exactly, you know, you will get this kind and gentle and encouraging support that helps you think through your choices, not not judgment. You know, they help you give you the right kind of experiences that you can use the rest of your life. Right. That's funny that you say that. You know that our, our evening snack, our nighttime snack now is a silent snack. Ooh. So <laughs> well, I'm coming back, so I guess I'll see this again soon. <laughs> a meditative. So now it's like it's not social hour anymore. If you if you want a nighttime snack and people have come back and they we thought they would be resistant to it, but they're so grateful because they go, you know, I thought I was hungry. But then when I sat down to actually eat, I realized that I wasn't as hungry as I thought I was. And if I were sitting in a social situation and just, you know, catching up with friends from the end of the day, that I would I would just go ahead and eat it, not even thinking about it. And so, I mean, obviously, we have an area for people to socialize and, and to connect and whatnot, but it's not where the food is. So, so, so important and even an even more distinct boundary. But no, that's so good. And I'm excited. I'm excited to come back and visit again. And just I'm so grateful for everything that you guys are doing. I think it's it's much needed. And I really hope I'm going to include in the show notes about the Be Her Now program and how they can find out um, more. Is there is there anything else that you want to say on how people can connect with Green Mountain or you before we wrap up today? Well, you know, I don't have any problems with put, giving people my email address. I actually, I like hearing from people and getting feedback. And so please share the Carrie, K-A-R-I at fitwoman.com. If people have any questions about the binge eating treatment or just Green Mountain and comment, you know, in general, just comments about, about what you talked about today. So really feel free to do that. People always are afraid thinking she's, she's so busy or, or whatnot. But I think that's really, I feel, I like to feel in touch with, with people out there and what, you know, what's going on. Great. Well, that's wonderful. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for your time and the inspiration. It was wonderful to talk with you. And um, go ahead and give us the website one more time. Okay. It's uh, fitwoman.com. It was a, from a long time ago. <laughs> F-I-T-W-O-M-A-N.com. Yeah. And that's great. I think it's, I think fit is great, you know, and we just, de- that we define what our fit is. And yeah, I love the blog and all the resources you have. And thank you so much for talking with me today. You're welcome. Have a great day. The Body Kindness Classroom is coming. If you're ready for some radical collaboration, check out bodykindnessbook.com and check out shop for more information. We're going to be having classes on body kindness calm and body kindness food. I'll see you in school.